it's just a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Arnold Rosen, DDS, MBA, all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, reading your bio, it's it's almost in, um, intimidating to be talking to you. It, it is it is a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Arnold Rosen, a maxillofacial prosthodontist who practices just outside of Boston. Dr. Rosen is an also an accomplished academia and entrepreneur. After earning his dental degree from New York University with specialty training from Boston University of Dentistry and Sloan Kettering Memorial Cancer Institute, he received an MBA from Boston University. Dr. Rosen has served as Director of Dentistry at New England Medical Center Hospital, as co-founder and director of the Dental Implant Center at Tufts University School of Dental Medicine and founder of the Tufts Dental Implant Fellowship Program. He is a highly sought after as a lecturer, a consultant with experience in developing implant training centers and implant facilities in the U.S. and worldwide. His most recent initiative is Oral, and it's so neat. He spelled it, uh, Oral was already taken, um, so he spelled it A-W-R-E-L, and I got to say something funny about this. Uh, the United Kingdom switched from oral cancer to mouth cancer because if you Google Oral, what comes up? <laughs> 18 million porn sites uh, and it does and uh, and that's what you said when you t- tried to go to oral.com it was a porn site so that's why they're going to mouth cancer and you spelled yours a w r e l which offers the industry's first hipaa compliant texting application the app is now available for download at the app store and on google play and enables individual and group messaging image and document exchange collaborative workflow cloud-based data archiving is now used by dentists, specialists, labs, device reps, and faculty and students in academic environments who today face the risk of federal fines when using the native Android and Apple texting environments on their cell phones. Oral, spelled A-W-R-E-L, is built on a transactional business platform, which allows it to be quickly integrated with practice management systems. This also provides opportunity for the company to expand into new areas of digital dentistry, on the radar, for example, are functionality for mobile smart forms and voice-enabled implant ordering. Dr. Rosen, co-founder of the nation's first telemedicine company before the internet was even around, and also founded Transcend Inc., which provides a prescription service connecting labs with dental schools and dentists for accurate and timely orders. I also want to read a couple of background things. Last year, the American Dental Association issued the statement. The federal government has begun auditing some healthcare providers, including dental practices, to ensure they are complying with pri- patient privacy laws and healthcare information security laws. And from the ADA, here's a quote We want dentists to be aware that this is happening to and to take HIPAA compliance seriously, said Dr. Andrew Brown, chair of the American Dental Association Council on Dental Practice, in an article titled Government Could Audit Dentists for HIPAA Compliance. There are steep consequences for healthcare providers that don't comply with the law. We don't want to see any dentist having to pay tens of thousands of dollars in penalty. Um, Arnold Rosen, DDS MBA says, across all industries, people using texting as today's go-to communications platform. Studies show that texting is the most efficient and effective way to communicate digitally. Open rates for texting are 98% while they're only 20% for email. More than 180,000 dentists practice across the U.S., and they're frustrated with slow, cumbersome, ineffective email communication. Texting is great, but only if it's legal. HIPAA violations carry penalties of up to $50,000 per patient record. Fines can exceed $1 million and may involve criminal prosecution, not to mention uh, your jeopardizing um, credibility. Um, God, there's so many things we could talk about. I mean, gosh, you uh, implant centers, um, lots of the my homies listening day might have never heard of Transcend. What What do you want to start talking about today? I could talk to you for 40 days and 40 nights. <laughs> so where um, do you want to begin? Well, I could I could talk. I, li- I like to talk about something called uh, opportunity, cost, and value chain in dentistry. So we could talk a little bit about that. You um, are an MBA. I don't think anybody listening to this, unless that MBA, even know what you just said. So start there. Repeat what you said and explain it. Okay. Um, you know, when when I got I got my business degree when I was uh, at Tufts, uh, running an implant center, um, and that kind of motivated me into doing things like getting involved with different forms of networking. Um, and uh, the first thing that I did was uh, a telemedicine company. 
Um, so and that when was I transcend. No, that was actually global telematics. It was before the internet was the vehicle for um, was the vehicle for networking. Um, and at that time, actually, telemedicine was really, it was one of uh, Wall Street's uh, babies and, um, you know, for numerous reasons, it never materialized um, as an active uh, industry. And, and that, that was partly because uh, it was based on video conferencing, uh, it was based on Lotus Notes, um, it was based on remote communications on communication lines that were unreliable expensive so infrastructure was a problem cost was a problem uh, and then there was reimbursement was a problem because telemedicine by, by definition is uh, remote consultations and clinical care and so uh, uh, there were things like state lines would you be in re re reimbursed and insurance companies would not reimburse so there was just just numerous different reasons for it never materializing but there were huge amounts of investment in it. And then the, and then the, the internet basically became the vehicle for communication. And uh, Howard, this might be interesting to you, but I started Transcend, which was the first internet-based communication link between dentists and laboratories. And it was right about the time that you started Dental Town. <laughs> the only difference between us was you were successful in creating this enormous community of dentists, which has been just incredible in educating people um, and helping them to do some of the things that I like to talk about. Um, and um, I only wish I was as successful as you were. So I really, you know, I look up to you in terms of what you've been able to accomplish. But we started right around the same time. Well, you know? there was about 20, there was like 20 people back then. Yeah, and most of them all went uh, south really, really rapidly, you know, and, um, and you survived and you flourished. So that was terrific. And I just want to, you know, tell you, I really respect, you know, the effort you put into it and your result. So, um, so what, what I'd like to talk about is though, and, and it's always nice to have something that nobody recognizes like the word opportunity cost, you know, so we as dentists, you know, we go into our office and we don't realize that, that how important time is. That's what we have. We can only generate income from our time. So, um, you know, I might go ahead and say, well, uh, so I did a crown, porcelain broke, I have to redo it, it's only my time. Well, what you did was you lost, you lost the opportunity uh, to generate income for that period of time. Um, and so opportunity costs also, um, you know, comes in many different fashions. So you might say, well, um, I'm not going to, you know, opportunity cost, I'm not going to take away from my normal clinical activity, so I'm going to do it at the end of the day. So you do it after your normal clinical hours. And so you may lose the opportunity to go and take your, and see your kid play soccer or something else. You know, so opportunity cost is something, is when we don't make the right decisions, um, there's a cost to it. Um, and in the business world, it's, it's called opportunity cost. And on the other side of things, we forget sometimes that there's opportunity cost to our patients. You know, they don't want to keep coming back to us for something. They want the best outcomes. And so, you know, in a snapshot, that basically is what opportunity cost is. So I like to look at things like project managing uh, care and things like that, and then kind of measure, you know, did we make the right decisions? And um, when we make the right decisions for our patients, have the best outcomes, you know, we're also the most productive that we can be. So that's kind of like, uh, you know, a, a snapshot of opportunity cost. So I just encourage people um, to um, make good decisions, work with good companies, you know, use quality products that have documentation behind them. Um, don't look for uh, the most inexpensive way that you can do things because often the opportunity cost uh, ends up being that you're less productive that you can be and you don't provide the best care for your patients. So, um, you know, that's... Uh, well, well when, when did you... Well, I'm, I'm going to follow that line of um, thinking on uh, implants because a lot of millennials say, gosh, I just went to the IDS meeting in Cologne, Germany, and there were 175 different implant systems for sale. And you were the co-founder of the... Uh, Dental Implant Center at Tufts University, one of the most prestigious dental schools in the world. What would you tell a 25-year-old kid who has to pick between 175 when you just said, you know, get research, don't get the cheapest? What what would you what would you recommend? You got a short list of implants you recommend? Yeah, well, I, I'm I'm not big on on recommending a specific product. 
Um, but, um, you know, and he, here's an interesting thing because there are certain premium products in the, um, in the industry. There's uh, Astra Dance Applied, there's uh, Nova BioCare, uh, 3i Biomed, Zimmer, um, um, among, among others. Um, and almost all of them have a premium product and are now coming, with, coming, you know, provide what they call a value product. So they're controlling, controlling quality of products, but recognizing that the industry has a requirement, you know, to have products that are not, um, you know, that are not so costly. And, um, I, you know, I, my attitude is work with a quality company um, that shows documentation for their products and that can provide you outstanding service. You know, when it comes right down to it, service is such an important part uh, of your daily practice. You know, so um, I think that's how I would, you know, typically I would look at it and say, um, you know, work with quality companies. Um, and, and there are some new, there, and there are several new products coming onto the market, and many of them are excellent companies. But I would look to be, you know, to make sure that they have documentation behind the product that I'm not the one who's, who's I'm, not, I'm not a test case, you know, that they can validate the quality of the product so, uh, and the service they can provide. And what, what year did you start that um, at um, Boston? Um, that was probably, um, God, time goes, how our time flies. So <laughs> I would say it was probably the um, around 1986. 1986. Well, a lot. Of, I'm going to stay on implants just for a little bit because you're a legend in that, along with so many other things. But a lot, a lot of kids come out of school and they say, "Hey, doc, um, I, I didn't place one implant in dental school." Um, do you, Do you think these young kids should uh, learn to place implants? Do you think that's something they should do? Um, what what, are your, what What would you tell if if you just had a 25 year old daughter walk out of dental school, three hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt? And you and you you've been in this business for forty years, and you're looking at her twenty five, her next forty years. Would would you recommend that this is a big area that she needs to start learning how to surgically place implants? Um, yeah, I would, I would, but I would do that with a caveat that um, I would train for competence, you know, and um, I would uh, not take a weekend course and then go out and start doing implants. I would be planning for uh, the long haul rather than the short haul. I'd want to have an expectation that I want to build my practice to do uh, 35, 40 implants a year. Um, I would be very selective on the kinds of patients that I treated, um, and I would never stop training. You know, I think that um, one of the more important things coming out of dental school um, is to never end your education, identify areas where um, you have an interest and you'd like to develop um, a level of competence and then work towards that competence. You know, in implant dentistry, I think you can do things that are um, simple. And I want to, I just want to clarify one thing. I have a real problem when somebody says, um, um, they say, uh, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, I hate that term. I think. <laughs> There is an elegance and a discipline in simplicity. And I think that what one should be trying to do is to uh, incorporate simplicity in the way that they do things from a business standpoint and from a clinical standpoint. Um, and they should, um, you know, I'm a specialist. So uh, we're trained. One of the things that we do by definition is try to make things as complex as we possibly can. You know, so it kind of it kind of helps to justify our specialty. But I really believe within my specialty that I try to do things uh, and practice simplicity, um, but do it um, in a way that uh, in an in a disciplined manner. Um, so you know, that aside, um, I forget where we were. Well, you're talking about um, if they should. Um... Well, oh yes. I, I, I would say one thing on your um, deal about keep it simple, stupid. My dental assistant's been with me. Uh, my my thirty year anniversary from dental school is this May eleven, and I've had the same dental assistant. And when I say um, it's a no brainer, she punches me in the shoulder pretty good. <laughs> she says, "What do you, what do you say that I don't have a brain?" And I said, "I didn't say it." She hates no brainer. You hate uh, keep it simple, stupid. But even Albert Einstein said, "If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough." Um, but he says everything should be made as simple as possible, 
but not simpler. So mm -hmm. you and Einstein both had a caveat on keep it simple, stupid. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler, which means kind of what you were saying. Yeah. So in, ter in terms of doing implant dentistry, my approach would be, you know, there's two places that I would start. Um, one, would, I would start with uh, the mandibular overdenture. Uh, mandibular denture converting to an implant-assisted prosthesis. Um, removable? And, yeah, removable prosthesis with two implants in the lower anterior mandible. Um, and I would start with uh, single tooth replacements in non-cosmetic, non-critically cosmetic areas. So that would be my focus. And I think that um, um, the lower anterior mandible has a low morbidity rate and also can be one of the most rewarding things that you ever do in your practice. Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay, so um, I had a friend who said to me, my mother uh, will not leave the house. Uh, we think she has a little bit of dementia, and, um, but she has, the reason she won't leave the house is that she has, um, she has dentures and she can't keep her lower denture in, so she's in pain from it and um, you know, she can't eat, and so she is socially, she's a recluse now. Is there anything you can do for me? So what we did was, uh, she had an existing complete lower denture, um, I did a rebase in it to get the vertical dimension okay and to make sure that it had good borders. We placed two implants that we retrofitted to that denture. Okay, a short time after we did that, my friend said to me, I just want you to know that, you know, my mother is like um, about 85, 87, and some people would say, oh, I'm too old for dentures, but this is really, what happened was that she came back and my friend said, you know, my mother said that this was one of the most important things in her life. You know, she's going out, she's eating, she's seeing her friends, her life has changed. And when she comes to see me, my friend said, she puts her best clothes on because she says, I'm going to see Dr. Rosen today. So, you know, if, you, if that doesn't stir you, stir you something in your insides to know that that simple procedure uh, has an impact of changing somebody's life so dramatically um, I think it's a great place to start, and the rewards are incredible. So, so um, true. Oral health can have a huge impact on mental health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, hygiene, mental I want to health. Ask you about a, 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 a cultural thing. When when you travel around the world, um, the Australians tend to be going towards one implant in the center. They tend to think down under that that's a better deal. And what what do you think of the one implant down the middle, like the Australians do, versus the two? For an overdenture that Americans tend to more do. Yeah, well, well, I would say firstly, you know, one of the uh, gurus of uh, implant overdentures, Tom Taylor, um, at the University of Connecticut, has done studies with one implant in the uh, middle, uh, right in the middle, anteriorly, uh, and they found in their studies that the uh, functional benefit from it is about the same as if you're using two. So this is kind of interesting and. Um, um, and it's an important thing to know that uh, uh, when you do two implants, um, you really have to bring them far anteriorly. So you're not getting that much more benefit from a retention standpoint than you would with one implant. When you're doing one or two implants, you're doing something called an implant-assisted overdenture. What it means is the denture is just going to it's going to move in function. So uh, the patient always has to know that the denture is going to move that if they want something but it has a huge dramatic effect on the quality of life of the individual who can't keep their denture in um, if they want to transition to something where uh, the denture isn't moving then they have to do something called an implant supported over denture and that means that you need to put four implants in uh, and the mucosa or the soft tissues are not supporting the denture uh, the implants are so when you do one or two implants, it's implant assisted, not implant supported. And there's a dramatic difference between the two. But one implant is, uh, is probably as effective as doing implants. And it's a great place to start um, to get involved with implant placement, um, the planning of it, the execution of it. Um, and, um, you know, in that training that we were talking about, you know, it's all trained for competence, do things you know, in stages, develop your confidence, um, you know, and that's the right way to do things for you and your patients. 
Well, this is uh, Dentistry Uncensored, so I'm right now about to throw you under a bus because you can't answer this next question without offending uh, a lot of people. Um, on Dental Town, we have 50 categories, you know, root canals, fillings, crowns, implants. We had to separate the root form implants from the mini implants because those guys, we have a report abuse button because when anybody was showing a mini implant case, most of the comments were, you shouldn't be doing that, and, and, and we decided as governing dental town that okay this person's already made a decision to do mini implants so let's not interrupt every yep. mini implant conversation with you don't believe in them um same thing we had to do with um uh, on cad cam with uh serac versus e4d you know anytime someone imposed e4d case all these serac people come on and say <laughs> they should have bought a, a, a serac and it's like look dude he already bought an e4d let's move on so what is your thoughts about um this implant assisted overdenture with mini implants versus uh, um, root, you know, larger 3.0 diameter implants. What, what's your thoughts on mini implants? Is there a place for them or do you not like them? Um, you know, first of all, I don't have enough experience to really with mini implants. And one of the reasons I don't is that um, I haven't found a need for them. I think price becomes one of the, you know, driving factors of using mini implants um, and simplicity. But one of the problems I have with them uh, is, that is that they're one, they tend to be one piece implants, except uh, I believe there's some new implants now that are two piece. But when they're one piece, it means there's very little flexibility in terms of uh, restorative designs. Um, you know, so I, I'm not sure of, um, you know, at least in my practice, the need for it. Um, I've seen some cases and I've seen some beautiful work that's been demonstrated in lectures, but um, I haven't seen any long term um, clinical trials that have uh, talked to the efficacy of them. I don't know whether you can be as flexible in your prosthetic designs. So I wouldn't say no to them. Um, I have had limited experience and mostly my experience has been a patient that came to me that had um, them used as a temporary uh, as a temporary support for um, a bridge while conventional implants were being placed. So um, I'm limited on the feedback I can give you on that. I also want to um, highlight something you said earlier, which really shows you have an MBA. Uh, you said when you're learning um, um, implants that you know, you need to reach a critical mass of 35 or 40 a month. And I, I, I want to talk about that a second because, I mean, 35 to 40 years is that I don't really think a dentist can be competent and and profitable if they're not doing a procedure once a week. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and when I see people spending an inordinate amount of money to learn some new deal, whether it be a sleep apnea appliance or Invisalign or whatever, and they're doing a case every other month, I just don't see the time spent, the getting ready for the. I I don't think they ever reach critical mass. Uh, and and you you called on to that, and you have an MBA. Do you think a millennial should realize that if they're going to learn something, whether it be sleep apnea, Invisalign, place the implants, that if you're not going to reach a critical mass of doing this once a week, you're really not going to get good, fast, proficient, and profitable at it. Yeah, I I think you're making an investment in it, in your time, in your armamentarium in the treatment you're gonna provide patients. And I think, you know, repetition is very important in, in certain kinds of procedures. Um, and um, every implant case is a little bit different. You know, there's no, you know, there's no stamp on things that it's always the same. So I think to develop competence, um, you know, that you have to have the objective that you plan to grow your practice, you know, in a particular technology to a certain level. Yeah, I think it's really important. Okay, well, they're they're listening to you right now, and my, my job is to guesstimate what they're thinking. And they're saying, um, Arnie, I just walked out of school, and I didn't place an implant. I didn't do an Invisalign. I didn't do a snore guard, a sleep guard, this and that. And there's all these things to learn. You're an accomplished dentist and an MBA. What do you think they should uh, start focusing their continued education on? I mean, we're both big believers in continued education where do you think they should focus their continued education on? Um, I think that's a good question. I think one of the areas would be, I think they should be focusing one area on implant dentistry because that's a growing, um, um, a growing market. Um, I think that there's a huge number of edentulous patients um, um, in, the, in this country. Um, and so I think that they should prepare themselves to work in that environment. It could be that they start their education 
you know, on the restorative side of things, and then they can decide if uh, if their interest is uh, on the side of implant placement. But at the very least, they should be focusing part of their energies on implant restorations. And um, also, I think that they should become very well informed on the products as well. You know, one thing that we tend to lack sometimes, uh, you know, from a protocol standpoint, when you send somebody to, uh, the process should be that implant dentistry is a restorative driven process. Um, and when you send somebody to a surgeon, a periodontist, or whoever it is you're working in, it should be by prescription. It's like I send somebody to an oral surgeon, they have number 32 needs to be extracted. There's a prescription that goes for that. The same should be true for an implant. I want an implant, I should be able to select the type that I wanna use because I'm growing some kind of experience with that. So I think that's an important aspect. I think another area that's a natural um, that I'm sure that most people are thinking about uh, is cosmetic dentistry. Um, we have patients who more and more have, um, you know, they have less and less cavities, but they have demands when it comes to cosmetics. Um, and even restorations when it comes to, I think every restoration, um, even um, a, you know, a, a two surface filling, you know, is cosmetic in some nature. So I think from a material standpoint, from case planning, um, you know, that the um, uh, young gen dentist coming out of dental school, you know, should be focusing on um, materials, um, procedures and, you know, cos and, uh, and cosmetic planning and cosmetic procedures. So I think that those are two areas that they uh, should focus on. One area, by the way, that I, it disappoints me with the lack of education um, is in complete denture concepts. Um, you know, less and less, um, you know, I, I set all my own teeth, I process my dentures, all that kind of stuff. There's very little of that um, being done uh, in dental schools now. I think the concept of whether you're doing segmental dentistry in one arch, uh, one quadrant, or you're treating a full arch, you know, that complete denture concepts really drive um, drive aesthetics, occlusion, uh, arch form, so many things are involved. So I would also, uh, you know, really recommend that, um, that a young dentist uh, take a couple of courses, not in, you know, what's the fastest way to make a denture, um, but uh, complete denture with an expert in complete denture concepts. You know, so, um Carl Misch just passed away, and he was one of the greatest implantologists ever, but he, he cut his teeth in a removable prost, and that was, uh, he started seeing these uh, fixed implant cases breaking, and they were blaming it on the implant, and he was sitting there saying, my God, you didn't have the bite down, you didn't have the denture down, and and he, he, always, he told me several times that he thought his mastering removable dentures was what gave him a leg up understanding in implant dentistry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Complete denture concepts drive, you know, so many aspects of, uh, of dentistry on the natural dentition. So there is such an important relationship between those from a cosmetic standpoint. I mean, when you do a, a complete denture properly, um, you address cosmetic issues, vertical dimension issues, occlusal issues, you know, all of those things drive the success of almost anything else that you do in dentistry. So, so you, you were telling these young millennials uh, just recently graduated, you know, implants, cosmetic dentistry materials. A big stress for them is evaluating all, the, all this technology. There's so much technology, CBCTs, lasers, uh, CAD cams, all, all, all this stuff. How, what, how would you tell her to wrap her mind about around decisions to invest in these technologies? Yeah, I... I, I <laughs> I would be careful about investing in these technologies. I would learn as much as I could about them. You know, for instance, a CBCT. Um, I don't need to have one in my, we have one in my office, okay? But I worked with outside vendors for a long time before we made that investment. So I learned a lot about the different softwares, about what a CBCT actually contributes to what I do. Uh, before I made an investment. So I wanted to be able to um, be informed in making decisions on those investments. And then the second thing was that I really needed to, you know, there are reasons for investing in technology. One is that you think it's cool and that's going to make you happy. 
to work with something that's technology. You know, may have no value, but you know, it, it makes you happy. So there's a satisfaction behind it. Another is that you identify a real value to it, um, and you have, um, and you have um, a business use for it. You know, that you can quantify. So it's going to have a qualitative and a quantitative value to you. You know, otherwise, you know, you can go out and uh, outsource for many of these technologies without uh, starting out by making investments in technology. So uh, I wouldn't be in a hurry um, to uh, jump into the water. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, when, when I talk about um, practice management, you know, and, and opportunity cost, I always say, is really the most important. But I always start by talking about fixed cost, variable cost, and opportunity cost. You know, I always say that fixed cost is everybody wants everything in the practice. Okay, well, you know, you can have the Taj Mahal for your practice. I said, but if one patient does not come in during the course of the month, you have to pay that fixed cost. Okay, and then the second thing you have to do is you have variable costs. You know, God willing people come into your office um, and you need product to support that. You know, there are a lot of different ways to approach that. So for instance, um, you know, people have different views of, of um, you know, sometimes they look and they say, well, I'm gonna get the cheapest product I can get, or I'm gonna get a quality product that's going to have a sustaining power. Um, I, I had, um, I work in a, in a practice where there's a lot of different specialists. Uh, and there's a children's dentist in, in our facility. And our children's dentist, one of the ways he thinks it's effective use of his dental assistants is to have them sit and cut the patient napkins in half because his patients are smaller than our patients. And I say, you know, well, maybe that's a valuable way to have them spend time. So um, there's fixed costs, knowing that you have to, um, you know, be able to you know, pay your salaries, pay for the lights, pay for your facility, you know, the variable costs that take care of your vendors. Uh, and then there has to be something left over for you. Um, and that's where every time you do something that can be characterized as opportunity costs, uh, it all comes out of your pocket. So you have to make good decisions so that there's something left in your pocket at the end of the month. So, uh, I, so, uh, I, uh, so to these kids, the uh, fixed costs, is the cost you're going to pay whether you see patients or not? Like you're going to pay your rent whether you have zero patients or ten or twenty or hundred. So rent, mortgage, equipment, build out, computer, insurance, malpractice, professional dues, HIPAA compliance, all that you pay every month, regardless of how many patients you have. Whereas variable cost, if you go from seeing one patient to hundred patients, you'll have an increase in costs like uh, labor, lab, and supplies. And then you talk about opportunity costs. I, I want to nail you on a specific. What do you think is a better MBA decision? Um, you know, when everybody talks about Crown and Bridge, you go to all the lectures and it's always, you know, full mouth rehab by prosthodontists. But the reality is 95 out of 100 crowns are done one at a time. They're mostly done on a first molar. Um, if you had to do a first molar, what would be the better MBA, MBA decision uh, to prep it, uh, take an impression with, say, Impergum from 3MSB, send it to your lab man. He makes a $100 zirconium crown. You get it back in two weeks and uh, cement it. Or to invest in a hundred fifty thousand dollar CAD cam or an oral scanner, uh, mill it in house, uh, um, optically impress it to send it to the lab. What, what, where, where do you think on your bread and butter? Uh, I wouldn't even call it ninety five percent. We'll call it the eighty twenty rule for eighty percent of your dentistry. Do you think? Do you think that technology uh, makes it faster, easier, higher quality, lower in cost? adding up to more profit dollars at the end of the day? Or do you think the old school way of just taking a quadrant impression, sending it to the lab man, getting it back two weeks later? Well, how, how, how does she get her mind wrapped around this decision? Because the CAD CAM machine is a $140,000 decision. And that keeps her up at night uh, while we're sleeping good at night. Yeah, I wouldn't make that. Well, first of all, there's nothing in the literature that shows that doing that way is better. Um, than taking an impression with Infragum. In fact, in multi-unit cases, there is some there is some research that shows that the impression um, with Infragum, as one example of an impression material, um, is more accurate than uh, doing a full arch in um, you know with a visual scanner. Um, I think the point is that you know you should build your expertise uh, from the ground up 
And so um, we actually are looking for scan looking at different scanners in our office now, um, but I use conventional materials. So I kind of outsource technology. Some is internal and some is out some is ex out is uh, exported and some is internal. So for instance, we got a, we, we got a we have a scanner, um, a CBCT in the office, but we invested that in that when it was clear to us that the numbers of patients that we had um, warranted that investment. Um, and also at that time, we felt like we could provide a better service by having it internal. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, having the, you know, the scanner, the ability to do the one, uh, the one, one day crown, um, I don't know that you're doing something that is better for the patient. Um, but also you have to have, you know, that critical mass of patients and procedures to, uh, um, to make a good decision to invest in that kind of equipment. You know, and then, and then we're also, we're, we're faced with the, with the problem that every month there's a new version, a new software, a new update, you know, at what point, you know, do you make the decision that this satisfies my needs? You know, so, um, I, I wouldn't sit there and let a salesperson sell me, you know, I'd want references. I'd want to talk to other people that have made the investments, um, and be really clear on how it's impacted their practice. Um, I, I want to ask you a, um, a another MBA question um, because you're so accomplished as a clinician, and uh, I mean, you went to Tufts uh, and you were at Sloan Ketter um, Kettering Memorial Cancer Institute, um, which was uh, funded by the great Alfred Sloan, who was the the was he the founder of General Motors? No, he wasn't the founder, but he he was the one who made the most money. I think it was under Sloan uh, that he um, uh, General Motors reached fifty percent market share. And he left a ton of money uh, to that mm-hmm. cancer institute. But the, the question I want to ask specifically is, you know, when you, when you talk about corporate dentistry or, or big box medicine, it seems like in, um, in medicine, they build brands on quality like Sloan, Mayo, you know, Cleveland Clinic, um, where, where the whole brand is like, these are the best. But then it seems like in corporate dentistry, it's all like uh, smiley dentistry, happy dentistry volume dentistry clinic dentistry i i don't why why do you think medicine builds their biggest businesses because like in cleveland the cleveland clinic is like one of the largest employers in the city of cleveland i mean it's a huge business and it's all built on that people are going there because they think they're going to get the mercedes benz of healthcare. Why, why do you think corporate dentistry hasn't taken that marketing branding approach of saying we're the best as opposed to we're just convenient and better hours and cheaper and faster and uh, more fast foody. Well, I, I don't know that they're not trying to do that. Um, you know, to take a different approach. Um, I, I think there were so many, you know, dentistry, I think is go- undergoing a lot of, uh, has a, have, has a lot of pressure from a lot of different places that medicine has already gone through, um, and has dealt with. Um, that's the insurance industry, um, and your ability to adjust to uh, pressures from insurance companies to provide services at certain levels, um, and corporate dentistry has been more effective um, at being able to deliver services uh, that take advantage of whatever the insurance industry's uh, demands are. Um, so I think that um, we're going to see more and more corporate dentistry that talks to branding itself as, um, you know, the level of qual- quality of smaller practices. And I think that the, that the trend in the industry it now is for corporate or, or large group practices um, where you can get uh, services in one place where there are economies of scale um, and you have the ability to Uh, deliver services and also to market your services more effectively. So I think, you know, large groups um, will be more and more the, you know, the direction of the future. And where along your journey, um, did you get, um, what what happened in your journey that got you so interested in HIPAA and made you start uh, AWREOral.com? Where where, where did that come along in the journey? Okay, well, a couple of places, and I, I just want to spend a minute talking about the value chain in dentistry. Sure, um, sure, take it away. Actually, this is going to be part of, you know, addresses part of that issue. 
Um, there's something in the value chain. The value chain is something in business that uh, there, there was one of the gurus of management at Harvard Man uh, Management School um, um, is was Michael Porter. Oh, in 1980, his books. In, in 1985, he came out with the concept of uh, of the value chain, and basically what it was addressing was how a company has to perform in order to be competitive in a global environment. The interesting thing is that everything he said. Um, is applicable to any business, regardless of how small or how large it is, and particularly in dentistry. So basically what I mean is there's a value chain. That means that uh, a patient comes into your office, there's a whole sequence of events that may appear to be independent, but they're never mutually exclusive. So for instance, a patient comes into your office, comes to the front desk, um, and every one of these elements we could spend a day talking about. So a patient comes into your office, comes to the front desk, they're either greeted in a way that they feel comfortable or you don't have a front desk person that's engaging. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is they come and you do diagnosis and treatment planning, a whole area which takes in technologies and all kinds of things. We could talk a day for it. Okay, next thing is that you help a patient to um, understand the technology, what they're going to have done, and there may be a surgical execution of, you know, the execution of a surgical component of it. So that has a certain level of expertise that we could talk about. There's the restorative component of that. There's the technology of uh, who's doing your lab work. Um, there's the suppliers that provide you the products and things and give you support. And then at the very end, um, there's something called follow-up, where you go through this entire process and at the very end you say, well, here was my plan at the beginning. You know, let's take a look at this patient and see, were we effective? Did we meet our plan? Uh, it, it actually is a very important element of, um, of this whole process. So um, this is, uh, you know, we could talk a lot about the value chain. Um, but I think it's very important, and this is one thing that I would tell young dentists is, don't look at the trees, look at the forest. You know, look at what happens when a patient comes in the door, and look what happens when, when you finish care on that patient. You know, one of the things that Michael Porter showed was that when you provide the best service you can, you're the most productive you can be. You know, one of the things that led to that whole concept of uh, uh, Japanese cars where uh, they kill the American in the auto industry because um, their process was to develop systems for zero defects while the U.S. had a lemon problem where if a manufacturing defect rate was 5 percent it was acceptable. So he changed the way that we look at business and in dentistry it is so applicable. So part of it is, and this is where oral came in, um, we talk about communication from the time patient comes in to the time you're finished, um, that we deal with different kinds of patient information. There are x-rays. I have to export the x-rays to the surgeon. He has to get back to me and give me a surgical report. I have to communicate with the laboratory. We tend to look at the trees and talk about the information that gets transferred, um, but we don't take a look uh, at the vehicle for that communication. Uh, for the platform for the communication to make it easy, uh, to keep continuity of information, and finally to um, not expose ourselves to uh, federal violations by using um, the native apps uh, on a texting phone. So um, this is kind of interesting. Um, one of the places that uses our application, I was at a dental school that uses um, our service for connecting dentists with laboratories. And um, so I went there to do some training. Um, and here I'm looking at students who are taking pictures with their phones of patients and texting it to the laboratory. I'm looking at the laboratory sending digital images and things of work in progress for approval back on the phones. Every one of those is um, a violation of a federal law called HIPAA. And while we ignore it, for the most part, because dentistry has flown under the radar for years, um, it's not the case anymore. And so uh, we said, well, everybody's texting, so why shouldn't they do it in a HIPAA compliant manner? And so that's what really drove the process of our doing this. Um, and so we did it in a manner where we can not only provide texting, but um, we have all kinds of business applications to stack on it, including 
creating a verbal environment where we're, uh, we've integrated uh, the Amazon Echo into our system so that one can actually uh, be or making orders um, and doing it verbally rather than sitting and typing. And on HIPAA, you're uh, at Oral, which is A W R E L for HIPAA, Oral for HIPAA uh, on Twitter. I just uh, retweeted your tweet. <clears throat> Uh, great white paper. What's next with text? Now's the time to think about the future of HIPAA compliant texting. Um, so if they go to uh, oral.com, A-W-R-E-L.com, uh, what are they going to find? There's a 30-day free trial, no credit card required. Uh, how much is this? To be, talk more specifics. Um, okay. Well, um, well, basically what we do is we charge $10 a month for unlimited use of the texting environment. And the texting environment is not only for collaboration, but it almost serves like a Dropbox uh, in that you can share uh, any kind of documents and store them there. So you could store your CT scans, your, your x-rays, all kinds of documents um, in this collab collaborative environment. So we charge um, $10 for um, for an unlimited license to use this application. And how much is it to download the uh, app on the uh, Google app or uh, Android Google Play? Um, there's no charge to that. So and it's a actually, free download. Yes, um, and it's really important. The really the important part of this is the desktop version of it. So what we do is we we marry desktop and and the mobile experience because on the desktop is where you're going to manipulate large files. So if you have a CT scan and I want to share it with you, um, I need really a, a desktop environment to do that. If I have x-rays, simulations of treatment, or any other kind of digital files, um, x-rays, PowerPoints, you know, just about anything, you know, I would do that on a desktop environment. And how long has this been out and how's your success with it? Um, well, you know, we spent about a, about a year and a half doing beta testing um, during which we actually took the product off the market for a while because we didn't like the way it looked. And um, starting in January is when we did a hard rollout. Um, we've been getting a terrific response from it because um, there's that part of the industry that says, no, nah, it's not going to bother me and I don't text that much. And then there's another part of the industry that says, you know, why should I expose myself to uh, um, the potential of a violation when I don't have to? So we've had great response from laboratories. Um, actually, there's a corporation now that feels that there's a need for um, an in implant company that feels a need to have uh, secure communication within their company. So, uh, you know, we provide this environment that is applicable, um, you know, in any kind of environment. In, in fact, um, you know, I'm from Boston, so I'm a Patriots fan. So I always say that if uh, Tom Brady had been using our application for texting, he wouldn't have had to destroy his phone. Of course, we know, we know he wasn't guilty, but um, you know he wouldn't have had to destroy his phone. Do you know anybody? What, what was his excuse? That he lost it, or what? What was his excuse? That he lost his phone? No, I think he said that he. Well, this is interesting. I think he said he destroyed the phone because. Um, you know, when you text, and this is one of the issues of HIPAA compliance, is when you text, all the information is stored on your phone. So that means if somebody steals it, hacks it, you lose it, um, all of that information is just sitting there for access to somebody else. You know, um, so when, when you use a HIPAA compliant product, you cannot store anything on the device. So, uh, so I think so he... Do, do you think there was anything... I'm a huge NFL fan. That's my... My one silly vice that I, and I do it just because it makes me so happy. I, I think it's insane uh, how much I love the NFL. But uh, so do you think there was anything to that deflation gate or deflating the footballs or what, what did, what was your take on that whole thing? Well, I, I think it was the weather. <laughs> it was what, do you really, or are you, are you joking? No, I'm joking. You're joking? I'm joking. Yeah. <clears throat> All I know is that um, I, for the second half of the game, he just, hammered that team, you know, with overinflated balls or the balls the, the way they were. So I, I think that, you know, the Patriots are the team that people love to hate. And so um, I think that, um, you know, the impact on him for something that they did not prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, you know, that the way they impacted him was, um, you know, was excessive. Um, and I think for us Patriots fans, <laughs> this year has just been 
absolutely the cat's meow. You know, I, I, I to me it was very inspirational because uh, I'm glad I don't gamble or bet because there's so many. The only in the last 20 years, the only 10 times I could have said I'll bet my house and my car on this, I would have lost my house and car. And when I walked away at halftime, I would have bet my house and my car. If you would have pulled up my driveway and said I'll bet you, you know, your car you know, that the, uh, that they're going to win. I, I would have laughed and taken the bet and lost my car, but it was just amazing how neither him or the coach crumbled mentally. I mean, as long as there was time on the game, they were just still meticulously ticking away at what they practiced so hard at, you know what I mean? And yeah, walked I, away and won. Yeah. I left, a, I left my partner's uh, Super Bowl party just because I couldn't stand it anymore to watch it. Um, but, you know, I think it, I think it is a good example for all of us there that um, every year the Patriots seem to come out with a new team. And I think that they're still always successful. And if you look at your practice, I mean, you can see here that management, the way you manage something, you know, and the quality of people that you work with in, in, in managing, it makes a difference. So, you know, Belichick and Brady. Um, every year you look at the team, I don't recognize half the people there because they're trading people, they're getting new people, you know, they know how to make use resources and to be a success. And I think, you know, that there's a very good um, message there for, you know, even us in our practices. I'm going to go back to, uh, we're, we're both MBAs, you mentioned Michael Porter. My my uh, favorite um, um, business book guy was, uh, who wrote Good to Great? Um, um, Good to great, built to last. How the mighty fall. Who's that? Jim Collins. Mm -hmm. I, I would I would say he's my favorite. A lot of millennials have never heard of this guy. But if you haven't read Good to Great or How the Mighty Fall or Built to Last, I mean th these guys are just at a different level of genius. And Michael Porter is on that top list of five. And his uh his book, The Competitive Advantage, Michael Porter, amazing. But he also wrote a book uh, on um healthcare just a couple of years a uh, little while back. Uh, redefining healthcare. Did you read that book? Did you have any takeaways on that, or I, I didn't read that book. No, but I think I think healthcare. God, it's such an interesting topic now. Um, so I think it's a controversial topic, um, and I think it's unfortunate that we don't provide healthcare. You know, a basic level of healthcare to every person in this country. Yeah, I think where they went wrong is um, what I don't understand is. Well, when they said we're going to cover everyone with no pre-existing conditions, yeah, that was the hum humane thing to do. That that was obvious. It's already been obvious for 20 other countries. I mean, if you're just waking up to that obviousness, you're kind of living under a rock. But but typical government, they they never try to figure out how to make it lower cost. You know, it's like um, you know they they have these grandiose, nice visions, but then when premiums skyrocketed, I mean, and what I don't and what when I read these books, I always think there's only two industries that are clueless when it comes to business. It's just healthcare and government. I mean, any, anybody making TVs and cars and radios and building houses and, and putting bread on the table and harvesting wheat and corn and Milo, they all get it. But it's just amazing how healthcare and government, it's, it's like when you go into the Department of Motor Vehicles. I mean, you know, they, they ask you, you know, uh, your name, your address, they fill, you, fill a slip. Why, why would you need my address if I've lived in this same <laughs> I, 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 you know, I've had this driver's license for 30 years in the same house. What, why, why do you need my address? I mean, same thing with the, uh, like, don't, I don't even want to get my string pulled, but, um, God, I, sometimes I wish that the, uh, affordable healthcare act would have just made, uh, the manager of every hospital and clinic in America go back and get their MBA. You know what I mean? It's almost like they could have gone to work and solved half their problems. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a couple of fundamental issues there that are interesting. One is that um, you have people that have pre-existing conditions and you want to provide some service for them. They can't afford it, so you need to provide some service. Um, of course, um, if you're buying insurance and you're going to use the insurance from day one, somebody has to subsidize that. It's like I live in a flood zone um, and um, we just had a flood. Um, my house was damaged. I'm going to buy insurance and I expect the insurance company to rebuild my house. You know, you can't exist that way. So uh, the subsidy uh, for some part of healthcare has to come from somewhere. You know, so we have that issue. Uh, and then there's the issue of states versus federal government that, you know, the states, you know, by definition, they want control of things. Um, and the federal government is probably, 
you know, one way is probably the only way that you could mandate, you know, some basic health care for, for everybody, knowing that you have to subsidize it somewhere. And um, that's where our part of where our taxes go to. You know, I, I know that we have a very different world here than we do in many European countries, but I have a lot of friends in Sweden where I, that I work with, um, and they say, you know, our taxes are outrageous, but I didn't have to pay for health care. Everybody's taken care of. Um, my kids go to school. I don't worry about what it costs. Um, and so um, I know our country is a lot different than Sweden, but it just kind of is a different perspective of life. But the, the thing I don't understand is in business, like um, take um, Chrysler. When Lee Iacocca um, innovated the minivan, he only got one free ride year where he was the only cat in town with a minivan. The next year, all other, I think it was nine other major automobile factors, the next year all released a minivan. And you got 20 countries all doing a lot of things right and wrong. And you never see a national discussion. Americans are so arrogant. There's no discussion about, well, what does Sweden do better? What does Switzerland do better? What does Taiwan do better? It's just, it's just like, it's kind of like when, um, when communism fell, uh, Poland just dropped it and said, okay, we're going to be just like America and the West. And they just adopted Ru Russia is still trying to figure out how they're going to go away from communism to some type of state sponsored capitalism. And it's like, why, why would you reinvent the wheel? I mean, there's, there's 50 countries that have a higher GDP per person than Russia. Um, and that's the way I feel U S healthcare is. It's like, they're trying to figure it out when you have 20 other countries. Um, every one of the single payer systems is doing like five things right and five things wrong. And if you go through that list one by one, you could set it up and do all things right. In fact, the best single national healthcare payer system was actually the last one that evolved because most of them came out after World War II, but Taiwan didn't start it till like 10 years ago. And they studied all the other systems and cherry picked out their best practices. And most economists believe that Taiwan does it the best. So, but you never see those discussions in America. You know, you know, it's, it's like, if I'm in America, I, I'm number one, why the hell would I look at Switzerland and who's Canada and Taiwan and Australia? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't want to get off on that because my blood pressure will get too high. That's why. <laughs> that's why I watch football instead of uh, news. Um, so, uh, so any any uh, more thoughts on your uh, www.awrel.com oral.com? Um, well, I, I would just I would just say you know that um, one of the things that um, you know young or old uh, dentists should be doing is being aware of your patient's privacy and security. Um, and the important thing is uh, that you have policies and procedures and you recognize that there's an issue there and you practice you know, policies and procedures that address it. Not that you're perfect, because the interesting thing is that if an incident happens in your office, so for instance, let's say somebody isn't happy in your office, they see their name somewhere, a picture of themselves, uh, and they're upset with you, um, you know, all they have to do is go to the Department of Civil Rights, which legis legislates HIPAA, uh, and make a complaint. And then you'll be audited. It'll be like the federal government is doing an IRS audit of your practice. There's no way that you can go back and complain about this individual. There's no recourse to that. Okay, so then uh, you undergo some kind of audit. Um, and all you have to do is show that you have policies and procedures in place. So something didn't work, so we have to correct that. If they come into your office or they come and see you with your mobile devices and you've got patient information and all of it, then you are uh, neglecting something that is legislated and basically violating a federal law. So I think it's so easy not to be, not to expose yourself that way. So um, I would encourage you to, you know, look at oral you know, look at other solutions, uh, but make sure that you uh, pay attention to your um, to your patient's security and privacy. Um, also, I think it's good to um, to educate your patients and to know that your patients are your best source of referral. And just always do what you feel is the best you can for your patients. Uh, your practice will be building as a result of it. Um, they're your best referrals, uh, and you'll be the most productive you can be. 
And I want to ask a, a, te- uh, a minor technicality question. Um, when you talk about HIPAA, you're, you're talking about texting and email, all this stuff. What about voice? What about when I'm talking to you about a patient? Does that fall under HIPAA? I mean, uh, is that recordable, traceable? Um, talk, talk about voice and HIPAA. Okay. Well, well, I, you know, I, I guess it's the environment with which you're speaking. You know, so if you go into a hospital and you, uh, you know, you look in all the elevators and it says, don't speak about patients in this environment. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like, um, I have a problem in my office, um, that, um, I have, uh, um, I have to keep asking my front desk people to use their quiet voice. Um, because when they're on the phone and they're talking with patients and they, they use their names and things, and part of it is that, um, you know, that actually is a violation of HIPAA, just that you're sitting there and you let everybody in the office know, you know, that so-and-so is a patient here, that they're coming for surgery tomorrow or something like that. So I think you have to be careful, you know, in uh, your verbal communication to um, be private also uh, in the way that you communicate. You know, it's an issue. This is kind of interesting that you mentioned that because um, we just did something with the integration of uh, Amazon Echo into our system. And so you'll be able to go into a message and say, uh, Echo, open my laboratory. Uh, What can I do for you today? Echo will say, Um, I'd like to order an implant supported prosthesis and uh, implant supported crown. And Echo will say, "Um, do you want it to be screw retained or cemented? And there'll be a guide, a tree that guides you through all of the options when you select that, and it will verbally guide you. Well, you know, one of the issues that we have um, is not that it could be done in private, um, but there's something called a business associates agreement. Um, and shortly, Amazon will provide. We we can't use that um, from a commercial standpoint until um, Amazon has completed their uh, their process of. Uh, being able to supply us with a business associates agreement. So that's kind of another part of HIPAA, but uh, you know, it's all part of that verbal. So um, very, very interesting. I think more and more everything that we do, you know, we're hands on, uh, our hands are full. Um, and I think the more we can do verbally in our environment, um, we can do it faster, uh, cleaner. Um, and I think that verbal is gonna be really driving much of the way that we practice in our clinical environment. Well, I was going to let you go with that question, but you just opened up another can of worms. One of the biggest debates in implantology on the uh, dental town message boards is uh, screw retained or cement. And you just mm-hmm. said on that order. So now you have to, you know, you have to tell these kids because a lot of people are saying, if you cement it, the cements are so toxic that if you can't clean it out or just get it just right, that a cement is a major cause of periimplantitis and that you should always do screw retained. What, what would your thoughts be on that statement? Um, well, my thoughts are that you can do cemented restorations that um, where you can effectively clean cement. So I would not make an absolute statement that way. You know, I go back to um, to the fact that when something is screw retained, it's retrievable. So it's serviceable. And I look at everything we do and it has a useful life to it. So I never use the term, this is permanent. I always say this is fixed. And so um, materials will wear. Um, at some point in time, you know, the implant may be fine, but I'm going to have to redo the prosthesis. Um, so from a standpoint of maintenance, um, screw retained is retrievable. So what we're starting to see is some hybrid restorations where there, um, a crown is cemented to an abutment outside of the mouth, but is made with the provision of being able to screw it, screw, screw the prosthesis in. So. There are some abutment systems. There's one called uh, the Screwmentable. Uh, the Custom Base um, is just one of the product types. Uh, there's angled screws to help to, there's angled access screw technology to help to correct angulations. Uh, often what we do with cementation uh, is to compensate for malpositions of implants with custom abutments and those types of things. You know, those abutments can have margins that aren't far subgingival that are right about at the crest of the tissue. Uh, so you can fabricate things that are cementable and make them uh, and make them cleansable. So I would not make an absolute statement about that. But I, I do think that the trend in um, the trend in the industry is towards screw retained, but not because of the cement. That may be one factor. I think it's really the retrievability. 
if you have a crown that's cemented on an abutment and that abutment comes loose, you have to cut that crown off. You know, if it was screw retained, you'd unscrew it and you would re-secure it or do an adjustment. Um, tell you another interesting area where that could be applicable. We're finding that a huge percentage of crowns that are placed on implants are ending up after a period of time with open contacts. You know, if you had something that was screwed in place, you can remove it, make an adjustment to the contact point, put it back in, everybody's happy. Um, if uh, otherwise, the only way to uh, replace it is to cut it off and to redo it. I must be a smuck because what I do is I just do a free DO composite adjacent to it on the house. Yeah. <laughs> um, I uh, Not was. You have two implants next to each other. I, uh, <laughs> I just did a uh, <clears throat> podcast with Bob Ganley, the, the uh, CEO of Williams Ivoclair, and he said that the holy grail. Uh, for Ivoclair, for um, implant cement, is a reversible cement, something that you could maybe ultrasonic or heat up or something, but they, they're they trying to make a cement that once it's hardened, you could do something to it to make it fluid again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's um, I have to tell you, a few years ago, I saw in a magazine, a scientific magazine, there was a cement in the aeronautics industry that um, when you when you applied a, it was a very strong cement and it was used for aeronautics and when you would apply an electrical current to it it would reverse and you could remove the separate the pieces so I went to that company um, and we put a little NIH grant that never went anywhere um, but in any case you know I think it would be just fantastic to have a God, reverse I wonder if Bob Ganley knows about that um, I doubt it, but I'm not sure about putting electrodes in somebody's mouth just to uh, um, reverse the cement, but um, it was kind of interesting. Well, what you do when you, get, when you get things like that, what I do is I always test that stuff out on uh, family members getting free dentistry. Yeah. <laughs> I figure if right. you're getting free dentistry, you're a research monkey at best. So, uh, mm -hmm. But hey, uh, uh, if you ever, um, uh, back to these millennials, uh, like I say, we put up like 350 online C courses and the views are insane. Um, if you ever want to grace our uh, online community with a continuing education course, I, I could listen to you for 40 days and 40 nights. I think your mind is amazing. You're an innovator. I mean, just uh, it is a huge honor that you came on the show today to talk to all my homies. Oh, thank you. By the way, Innovator's Dilemma, you read that book? Yes. Okay, so so anybody out there who wants to be an entrepreneur, read the Innovator's Dilemma, just so you know the problems addressing. And and and, and, and talk about the highlights of that book. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, what they're saying is, you know, sometimes it's not good to be first; it's good to be second or third. You know, when um, you know when you're an innovator, um, you know, you're making the investment in um, in technology. Um, and uh, you have the issue of having to create a market for that technology. Uh, by the time you get out there, if you have any resources left, somebody else may be out there to, uh, you know, to replace, you know, with a with a better product, with less investment. Um, and it's not so easy to protect your your, you know, even with patents these days, it's not so easy to protect your technology. And you know, going you know, back to the history, you know, so many people believe that you had to invent it or at least be the second person. But go back to AOL, remember back in the day? I mean, yeah. what, what was AOL, like number five, six, seven, or eight to come along in that space? So many mm -hmm. people were before AOL, um, but AOL crushed it. I mean, IBM was like um, number seven or number eight. Uh, there were so many other people that, that came to the party first and didn't mm -hmm. make it. Yeah, um, by the way, I just wanted to say it's an honor to, to be um, on this program with you, Howard. I really appreciate your uh, ask, asking me to participate. And I actually am in the process of filling out the documentation required to do a course on Dental Town. And I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and, um, you know, this has been a great experience. You are terrific. Well, well, I just hope everyone's listening to you on iTunes and not watching you on YouTube and uh, Dental Town because your hair just <laughs> looks too good next to my bald head. I'm, I'm hoping it's a wig. Please tell me it's a wig. It's too good to be real, right? You, 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 real. Have, a, you have a single mini implant on the top of your head holding in this wig. Is that what it is? Not yet. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again. I so look forward to your online C course. Okay, thanks, Howard. All right, thanks.